In this section, we're going to start looking at different ideas that people between 1250 and 1500 had around, firstly, what how their body worked, and secondly, what might make it go wrong and what might cause illness and disease. So we're going to start with the four humours theory. Now, humours is a word that's taken from the ancient Greek, humon, which means liquids. Or fluids so this could just as well be called the four fluids theory and the reason it's in Greek is because it was thought up by various Greek physicians physician by the way you probably come across this word quite a lot in this course means someone who practices medicine so if you come across it that's what it is be aware though that across the course of history, this might not necessarily mean that they had very much in the way of formal training. Now, the two physicians who really developed this idea um, were Greek, and these ideas were very old by the time we get to medieval times. So the first person to think of them was this man, he's called Hippocrates, and he was a Greek doctor from the 5th century BC, or BCE, depending on which you use. So by medieval times, this idea is really 1,500 years old. And he watched his patient's symptoms very carefully. He recorded the results, and he came up with this idea of the four humours. Now, later on, quite a long, long time later on, his ideas are developed by this man, who is called Claudius Galen. Sorry, Claudius Galen. And he was born several hundred years after Hippocrates in 129 AD. And he was a physician at a gladiator school, first of all, but later on became physician to the Roman emperor and his family, which gave him quite a lot of time to observe and write and apparently perform live shows showing off his medical knowledge by dissecting pigs while they were still alive, by all accounts. So these two men write down a lot that forms the basis of the understanding that medieval people have around disease. And the fourth th humours theory is based around the idea that there are really four fluids that make up the human body. Now, the first of these is really easy. This is blood. And we all know what that is. The second is something called yellow bile, or perhaps collar. Now, the best way I have of describing what this is, I don't know if you've ever been so sick that your stomach is completely empty and yet you can't stop being sick. And eventually you start to retch up a really nasty, thin, yellowy, green kind of a liquid that tastes awful. Um, that, as far as I understand it, is bile. And that's probably what they were thinking of when they named yellow bile or collar. We're not sure what they meant by the next humour, which is black bile. It was perhaps where blood had clotted in some other liquid like pus or poo and made it appear black. That could have been what they were thinking of with that one. The fourth is my favorite word in the whole world because of the way it's spelt. Um, this one is spelt phlegm, but it's pronounced phlegm. And that's snot and it's in the stuff that you hock up at the back of your throat when you've got a really, really bad cough. Now, the idea is that the human body is made up of these four liquids or these four humours and that health is achieved by balancing them out. So people need to have enough of each one, but not too much of any. And those are the ideas that form the basis of a lot of diagnosis and treatment in medieval times. So when they were diagnosing people, medieval doctors would look at the associations that each humour had. Each one was based on one of the four elements. So Hippocrates believed that there were four elements and each one related to a humour. So blood was air, a yellow bile was fire, black bile was earth and phlegm was water. In addition, each one produced either hot or dry, sorry, hot or cold symptoms, 
and wet or dry symptoms. So for example, blood, having too much blood might produce symptoms that were hot and wet. If someone had a fever and they were very sweaty and their skin was very warm, that might be thought to be too much blood. Whereas if they had a cold and their nose was running and their eyes were running, um, and they were shivering, that might be seen as being caused by too much phlegm. I'm sorry about the tumble dryer symbol. I couldn't think of another way of doing it. Um, yellow bile produced symptoms that were hot and dry. Perhaps if somebody had a fever that made them get very parched and their mouth and their lips to get very dry. Black bile produced symptoms that were cold and dry. And each one then also relates to a season. So blood relates to spring. Now this might be when you were born. So if you were born in the spring, you might be thought to be naturally inclined to have too much blood. Whereas if you were born in the summer, then you were probably likely to have too much yellow bile. If you were born in the autumn, then you might have too much black bile. And if you were born in the winter, then you might have too much phlegm. You can see there as well where the symbols of the zodiac are next to each one, because this also linked into people's ideas about astrology and the idea that everybody had a star sign relating to the month in which they were born. And that could indicate which humour they might have too much of as well. It also might depend on when you got ill. So, for example, in winter, people might develop colds, um, which, of course, produces a lot of phlegm. And so that would be seen as a winter disease that happened when the weather was cold and wet. So you can see how it all starts to fit together in the minds of people. Finally, each humour had a mood that was supposed to be caused by too much of it. So blood for example too much blood was supposed to make people sanguine and that's kind of cheerful and energetic that's taken from the old latin word of sanguineous which relates to blood so if somebody's drained of all their blood we say they were exsanguinated you can see the root of that word um, the root's more obvious in the terms of yellow bile. That's supposed to make people something called choleric, which means quick-tempered and bossy and argumentative. Galen, apparently, believed that he had too much yellow collar, which indicates to us that he might have been a bit of a bossy boots. Um, black bile was supposed to make people melancholic. Melas is the Greek word for black. So this is black mood. And basically, when we say people are melancholic, we mean that they are sad. And perhaps depression would be diagnosed as having too much black bile in medieval times. And then finally, too much phlegm makes you phlegmatic. And that's very calm and unemotional and slow to react to people. So again, doctors could use these associations when they were making diagnoses of people. Now, in terms of curing the problems caused by having too much of one humour, um, there were a number of theories around this. Medieval doctors would quite often try to get one of the humours out of you. So, for example, too much blood might be cured by bloodletting, where they cut open your veins and drained a pint or two of blood out of them to reduce the amount of blood in your system. They might also purge people. That's encouraging vomiting or diarrhea to get rid of various biles. So that was one way of curing it. Now, Galen, when he was adding to Hippocrates' ideas, also came up with the theory of balance. which was the idea that you could cure too much of one humour by adding another. So, for example, I'll just put Galen there so we know it's him. So, for example, if somebody had a, a fever that was making them very hot and dry and indicated that they had too much colour, Galen would perhaps suggest that they ate cucumber, which is cold and wet. 
So you balance out the hot and dry with cold and wet. If someone has a cold and their eyes and nose are streaming and they've got too much phlegm, then Galen might suggest red peppers, which are hot and dry, to balance out that humour. So that was one way in which this four humours theory might affect medical treatments. Galen also comes up with a number of other ideas that are just quickly worth exploring of varying degrees of accuracy. Um, one is that he believes that speech is caused not by the heart, as people thought beforehand, but by the brain and controlled by the brain. So speech is controlled by the brain, according to Galen. He recommended dissection. He thought it was good for physicians to cut open dead bodies and have a look at how they worked. He did say though that if you couldn't find an available dead body, then you were just as well off dissecting an ape. Um, because they were just the same as humans, which we now know wasn't true. So that's another one of his ideas. He believed that blood was produced by the liver and circulated through the body. And he also suggested that blood was circulated, not just by the veins, which is what people believed before, but also by the arteries. He did also believe that pus, which is that um, gooey stuff that can gather on a wound, um, he believed that that was good. Um, he believed that it actually flushed out infection. So we'll just draw some arrows to make it clear that these are coming from Galen. And then we'll put this one over here. So he believed that pus was good. And medieval doctors would quite often bandage up wounds and add ointment to encourage the production of pus, which we now know wasn't such a good idea. Very few people challenged the ideas of Galen um, in medieval times, but one of them was a surgeon called Henri de Mondeville, so we'll put him in pink. And he encouraged people to really clean the wound. And then closing it as soon as possible. Rather than encouraging it to develop pus, um, which probably worked a lot better. So not everybody agreed with Galen on that one, which is perhaps just as well. Now, as we've seen, these ideas were incredibly old um, and it might seem strange to us that medieval people continued to accept them, you know, a, millennium, a millennia and a half after they were first developed. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is that Galen wrote a tremendous number of books. He actually wrote 350 books about um, a combination really of his own findings and traditional Greek medical ideas. So that meant that there was a lot of information about this. And after the 11th century, these were translated into Latin and then distributed among medical universities. So this information was sort of informing the people at the top of the forefront of medical, medical knowledge. And that's important. The medical universities, by the way, encouraged learning through books rather than experience. Um, and obviously, Galen had a lot of books. However, there are other reasons why people in medieval England 
might have accepted these ideas more readily. Firstly, because they had respect for traditional ideas, they didn't tend to challenge things very much. Um, so very few people would have thought to ask questions around this. Secondly, because these ideas have the support of the church, the church was an incredibly powerful and influential institution and it agreed with Galen, partly because Galen believed in one God, although he wasn't a Christian. And thirdly, because these ideas just made sense to people. They could see that when people got ill, their nose might bleed or they might produce lots of phlegm or wounds might produce pus of a certain colour. And so these ideas made sense to them and it brought together a lot of their understanding of the world. So as a result, the four humours theory informed a lot of medical understanding and medical knowledge in medieval times.